So we're happy to have Anna Hasenfratz from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, Anna works on lattice field theory. She's been very successful. Um, originally, she was scheduled to be here, but she couldn't make it. So she's doing this online instead. And we're very glad to have you. And please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I am indeed very disappointed that I, I didn't make it when I uh, was first invited to uh, this workshop like two years ago. I, I was so ready to go. But then pandemic happened and life happened. So now I have to do it from uh, home in Colorado, which is uh, 11 and a half hours uh, behind India. So um, I try to attend as many talks as I can, but most of them are uh, during the night. Good. Um, 10, 15 years ago, I had a poster that, that described all known physics. It is kind of disappointing that all known physics is not much more than uh, what that poster uh, uh, denoted. Of course, um, I am not quite sure why this quantity here is called Schrodinger psi function. This is what we would call the partition function or functional integral of a um, quantum field theory system. And uh, well, it has uh, practical gravity, I guess, maybe. Uh, Maxwell equations, uh, Young Mills equations, so that U1, SU2, SU3, there are direct uh, fermions and the new cover coupling with Kobayashi Matsukawa and the Higgs mechanism that at that time was already discovered. But it doesn't have is quantum gravity, string theory, and holography, all the topics of this workshop. Um, let's hope that at some point, some at least some of those uh, projects will get online. Um, I have to start with a confession. I don't work on quantum, quantum gravity or string theory or holography. Probably that's why the organizer asked me to give introductory lectures to Lattice QCD. Lattice QCD, and in particular, uh, Beyond Standard Model and Lattice QCD as applied to uh, conformal systems uh, uh, is my interest. But there are uh, several talks on the schedule that rely on uh, quantum, lattice quantum field theory. So I will try to give a general introduction to the topic. Unfortunately, um, I don't know what uh, everybody's background is, but I assume that you know quantum field theory uh, to some level. But I also think that many of you probably don't know how we deal with quantum field theory on the lattice. So my goal is to get, get, have a very general lecture uh, the, today and then continue with the Wilsonian renormalization group uh, tomorrow. And in the last lecture this week, I will try to talk about gradient flow and its applications, which is closely connected to the first two topics. Then uh, next week, when there are shorter lectures, uh, more uh, workshop style, I will have a 30 minute talk where I will talk more about what I am actively working on today and interested today. Because 30 minutes is not quite enough, I will, if that's 30 minutes, I will rely on several of the things I will discuss uh, in this week. Um, I also want to say that feel free to interrupt me or if you are online, enter questions to the chat window. Um, this is, I consider as a school or a, or, a, or a more pedagogical program. So don't take it as a 
at the conference where you just listen and if you get lost, you get lost. Don't get lost. Ask me. Um, good. So let's start with something uh, that I assume uh, everyone is familiar with, QCD. And in particular, QCD in the continuum. The only difference here is that I want to use Euclidean time from the get-go because it makes it easier to discuss uh, this system uh, on the lattice. So what do we have here? I wrote down the action uh, that is uh, has two terms, the gauge term at mu square and the fermions that interact with the Dirac operator. I have here the definitions uh, just for completeness. Uh, I assume that uh, in addition to the recorded lectures, you will have access to slides. I will uh, give this slide uh, to the organizers if they post it, so you can look it up. Um, the partition function Z is simply the functional integral of the exponential of the action. And if you want to calculate expectation values like correlators, uh, we simply take uh, the operator under the functional integral and normalize it with this. So these are all very, very standard. The good uh, part of this continuum uh, description of QCD is, um, well, there are a lot. First of all, it, it, the good thing is that it seems to describe strong interactions. It has, it is an SU3 gauge system. It has SU3 gauge invariance, which is very restrictive and therefore very predictive. This formulation in the continuum, of course, uh, um, preserves all the continuum symmetries. It has Lorentz invariance, CP, and T symmetries. A very those are pretty standard. An important property of QCD is chiral symmetry. Chiral symmetry is a symmetry that we immediately see from uh, the Lagrangian. If we, the, the, the entire system has a vector symmetry, but if we are in the massless limit, it also has a chiral symmetry. And that's uh, essential to understand what the spectrum and the properties of uh, QCD is. This, these statements are all straightforward from simply from the definition. We can also do perturbation theory. And in this case, I will think of perturbation theory in terms of the bare coupling G0. Uh, we could do it in terms of the renormalized coupling, but per cup, their coupling is as good as any. Uh, what can we do? Well, we can start calculating Feynman diagrams, like um, contributions to the gauge coupling or the inter, like that. This calculation would lead us to what we call the QCD beta function. What is the beta function? The beta function describes the energy dependence of the gauge coupling, that is the running gauge coupling. Uh, this is a perturbative expansion. It is known by now up to five loops. For completeness, I wrote down here the first two coefficients because I'll, there is a lot we can learn from those first two coefficients, and also because the higher order coefficients depend on the renormalization group scheme, and I didn't want to bother with that. So we know that this is this is pretty much textbook material, not the fifth loop, but certainly the first uh, two loop with a function. What does it tell us about the system? Um, if we take a small number of flavors. So let me just go back here and, and remind you here what, are the, what the notation here is. NC is the number of colors that I will assume to be SU3 
throughout these lectures, but could be different. And then NF is the number of fermions, and the, those fermions are in the fundamental representation. Uh, you can immediately see from the first equation or the first term here that if the number of flavors is zero or in general small, then beta zero or B zero, the one loop coefficient is negative. But that means that the beta function starts negative, and it is generally believed, although not proven, that it will stay negative. This is the confining chirally broken QCD light system that uh, we hope will describe uh, all the particles that you can find in the particle data group or uh, in general strong interactions. There is another limit, and let me go back here. Um, again, if you see, if you look at um, the one loop coefficient of the beta function, if the fermion number is large enough, that is larger than uh, 33 divided by 2 times nc, or, or 33 divided by 2 if nc is 3, then the beta function will change sign. It becomes positive. In that case, and that is the case I am referring to here, the beta function is positive and it becomes infrared free. This is the asymptotically free case. Oh, sorry for that. While this case is infrared free, that is free, not asymptotically large distance, uh, small distances, but in the infrared limit at small energies. Um, what happens in between? How does the system go from asymptotically free, all negative, to infrared free, possibly all positive? Well, perturbatively, it uh, develops a zero somewhere. It remains negative for a while and then turns positive uh, and uh, de uh, develops what we call an infrared fixed point. These are the conformal systems that uh, are very interesting, not only for uh, phenomenological uh, point of view, but also theoretically. And I think there will be several talks or several discussions about that. Um, I want to make one more comment in here about the infrared part. Perturbation theory tells us how the beta function starts. But of course, once we get to stronger couplings, we don't know how it will behave. There have been uh, speculations that this beta function actually uh, will change yet again sign. It will turn back and then develop yet another fixed point. These are the so-called asymptotically state systems. I will not talk about them, but I mentioned because I think it's very interesting. And maybe someone in the uh, conference or school uh, will need that picture or will, require, will, will talk about it. Uh, I want to go back now to the conformal system and just mention that by this picture that the uh, beta function develops a zero is perturbatively correct. And in fact, we know that the, the, this infrared fixed point emerges at infinity and then moves in uh, as the number of flavors uh, increase. That's not the only possibility. There is a very interesting uh, Set up, and this is at this point I am still in the continuum, but again I spend time on it because I think uh, it will be needed. For, first of all, it's interesting, and I will need it later on. So, what is this other possibility? It's a hypothesis. We don't know what what if, if nature indeed decides to to follow that pattern, 
But another possibility is that instead of having a fixed point coming in from infinity, it's possible that the fixed point emerges at some finite g squared, physically because the beta function has a quadratic hump, like I denoted here in uh, the plot here. Uh, as the number of flavors increase at some point the beta function will have a quadratic hump and the moment it touches zero uh, the system becomes conformal and then the, that, that would correspond to alpha equals alpha star and then as the number of flavors increase and alpha increases further the hump will go higher and higher and we'll have a conformal system with two uh, fixed points and infrared and the UV fixed point. Uh, this is a picture I will uh, come back to later. And why did I discuss it here? Because we understand how it can happen simply based on perturbation theory. Perturbation theory tells us what happens at small g squared with small number of flavors, small g squared at large number of flavors. It also tells us the small g squared behavior even in between. What it does not describe is this scenario in between that is the emergence of the conformal system. Um, that is one reason why we want to do lattice calculations because we want to be able to study the large, the strongly coupled regime where perturbation theory is not uh, applicable. So let's go back to this uh, continuum QCD in Euclidean space. Um, I listed the good parts that we can do with the continuum and there are a lot of that. But there are some uh, not that optimal uh, possibilities or, or, or issues here. I already mentioned that large G square is uh, it cannot be, does not describe large G square. Uh, but there are some other issues. The first one that I might mention that, in fact, this entire setup that I described here with the, with the functional integral is not defined. That functional integral has an infinite dimensional continuous integral. It's mathematically not. Uh, defined, the only way we can deal with it is if we have only quadratic terms in the action. But of course, we have more than quadratic terms in the action. So we need to find a mechanism that actually defines the functional integral mathematically correctly. We also uh, have the problem that once we start doing uh, perturbative calculations like the diagram, the simplest diagram that I wrote down here or drew on the previous page, we have a loop integral and that loop integral will diverge. We'll give infinity. The way to avoid that is to do, uh, is to regularize the system somehow, uh, either with dimensional regularization or cutoff um, matrix. Uh, the infinite integral is finite. finite. Lattice will do, will solve both of those, these problems. In fact, all three problems, because lattice definition allows non perturbative calculations that, that uh, uh, will allow us to calculate or give predictions even at strong coupling. That is. Uh, we can do a controlled non-perturbative numerical calculation, even at strong coupling, and we can discover properties of uh, not necessarily QCD, we understand that pretty well, but systems like uh, 
systems in the conformal window that could have non-perturbative new properties that we really don't see perturbatively. So that's the motivation why we want to do uh, lattice calculations. How do we do that? How do we do? How do we lattice? How do we discretize the system? I want to describe it here in a a simpler model. Let's not jump immediately into QCD. I want to start with the five to the four scalar model. Again, uh, start with the continuum action. It has um, a kinetic term, a mass term, and then on the five to the four interaction term. It's very easy to put or to discretize this, this model on the lattice. We simply uh, replace uh, the continuous variable phi x with variables that sit not at continuous space time but at fixed lattice sites, like the red points in here. This is my lattice. This would be my lattice spacing A. And I will have points at phi n, phi n plus a. Um, uh, in fact, let me not say that. Good. Um, so that will, that discretization will take care of um, the second and third term. We simply replace phi x squared with phi n squared. The issue is what do we do with the derivative? Because the derivative uh, uh, has to be approximated if we have uh, variables at discrete space time. So we simply have to discretize the derivative. Here is the simplest derivative, just a, a simple difference between uh, neighboring lattice sites. Now, if we take this derivative, and substitute it into the action up here, uh, we'll get, well, I just wrote down the terms as they are. The interesting thing is that when we expand the derivative term, we get what we recognize as a nearest neighbor interaction. That is an interaction between a point that sits at, let's say, n and its neighbor sitting at n plus mu. This looks like now very much like an easing model or a statistical uh, physics model. Um, I have here a comment and I won't go through here because I think I am talking very slow in here. Uh, but let me say that as a homework assignment, work out the dimensions. Figure out how the dimensions work around of the what we know is that the action has to be dimensionless. And I want to say that the mass has dimension one, that is we measure everything in mass dimensions. Try to figure out what happens with the phi and lambda. And uh, see if I actually put in here correctly the lattice spacing. Uh, terms that, of course, uh, a carries dimension of minus one, that's a distance. It will be useful to see that uh, uh, later on. Good. Now, so that was only up, up to this point, we had only the discrete action. Now we want to put it in into the partition function. And because the phi field are uh, discrete, the functional integral that is a continuous infinite dimensional integral will turn into a sum, still infinite dimensional, but a sum can be handled with still well defined if it's in infinite dimensional, uh, not only if it is finite. So Z, now the partition function is well defined. And what's more, because uh, the lattice, the, 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 uh, fields are defined at discrete lattice sites, that makes the momentum uh, finite. The largest momentum that we are going to call cutoff 
is pi over e. It cannot be infinite, therefore the integrals are finite. The system is regularized. That's how a lattice approach will achieve two things. It will define the system, that is, it will define uh, the partition function mathematically rigorously, and at the same time, it will regularize the system by introducing a finite cutoff. Uh, of course, we still have to deal with the question of how do we take the lambda cutoff to infinity, but that is a question that we'll deal with in a couple of slides later. Good. Um, once we have a partition function, we can start calculating things. The simplest thing and probably most, maybe not the simplest, but, but most interesting is to calculate a correlation function that is calculate a quantity where we take a phi a point somewhere and another one far away at distance x and we want to see how they interact or how they react to each other, how much they are correlated. Um, it's relatively easy to show that this correlation function is should behave exponentially. It should decay exponentially e to the minus x over psi. Or if I want to write it in terms of dimensionless units, e to the minus x over a divided by psi over a, it's an exponential decay, and psi is what we call the correlation length. that describes how far or at what distance the different fields are correlated. Um, correlation functions are, in general, decay exponentially, as I wrote it down here, with one exception, not, uh, not with one exception. There are, there are several exceptions, but, but, but the most, uh, uh, gen most frequent one is then the correlation length is infinity. When the correlation length is infinity, this uh, uh, exponential decay would uh, simply say that uh, the uh, fields are infinitely correlated independent of x. That's obviously not correct. Uh, we know from statistical physics that in that case, the correlation function phi x phi zero should have some kind of uh, power-like decay, one over x uh, to some power that you can do. Uh, well, no, you cannot really work out because there is there are some, some tricks uh, involved in there, but you probably have seen it before. The exponent alpha depends on the dimension and on the um, critical exponent data. But that's what the lattice approach uh, does. Now, let's move on to probably mo the most important question for uh, QCD-like systems or, or quantum field theories on the lattice, and that is how do we take the continuum limit? We are not necessarily interested in what this system does uh, uh, when the cutoff is finite. We want to take the lattice facing zero, the cutoff to infinity, we want to recover the continuum quantum field theory. One might say that, okay, let's just take the lattice facing to zero. Except if you go back here, um, or uh, see it here, if you write down the action or the partition function in terms of dimensional units, it has no lattice spacing. There are no dimensionful quantities that show up in the lattice approach discretization. So the lattice spacing has to be taken differently. I might say it in a way that uh, think about it. If this this uh, uh, system 
that is uh, uh, system if we want to simulate it on a computer you cannot put a, a dimensional full quantity in the computer or you could but it is kind of meaningless on a, on, in a computer simulation we have numbers those are just uh, dimensionless numbers we have to find out what the lattice spacing is through these dimensionless properties of the uh, of the system. Now we see that uh, probably easiest if I go back to the correlation function that decays as e to the minus x over psi or in dimensional units it is x over a over psi over a it is probably best written as uh, the exponential form of the distance between the two points and x divided by the lattice correlation length that is uh, psi lattice is psi over a. I made a picture in here, so these are my two points. That's the distance between them in dimension for units, but in lattice units, it is just m uh, x over a. This is my lattice spacing a, and maybe I have a lattice correlation length that is like that. Uh, in this case, that would be four units. Okay, so then how do we take uh, the continuum limit? Well, we still want to have the lattice spacing get smaller and smaller. So this is an example. It is the same setup as before. I have the same two points, but now the lattice spacing is half of what it was before. It's obviously a much finer lattice. The correlation length still the same in physical units, but now the lattice correlation length will be not 4 as on the previous slide, but 8. So a finer lattice is really nothing more than a lattice that has a correlation length in lattice units larger. Or in other words, um, the continuum limit corresponds to finding the limit of the lattice action where the lattice correlation length goes to infinity, that is the system becomes critical. And that's an important point that there is a an equality between continuum quantum field theories and statistical system when they become critical. And that is the continuum limit. The continuum limit is when our uh, lattice system will have infinite correlation length or becomes, uh, or the, or becomes critical. Um, we'll need that uh, uh, information later on when we ask uh, um, about the continuum limit of not only QCD, but more complicated uh, systems that could have non-QCD-like fixed points. Good. Um, discretization effects. One issue that all this shows up on the lattice. Um, it's easy to uh, illustrate it in terms of the phi to the four model that we have been we have looked at uh, before. If I have uh, uh, my lattice action, as we discussed, the only questionable thing is how do I discretize the derivative? And uh, in the previous example, I just suggested to discretize it with a simple uh, nearest neighbor difference. But we could take the derivative and discretize it with a five-point stencil that is simply a numerical derivative that we know has a much better convergence or much better describes the 
actual continuum derivative by taking points that are plus two and minus two steps away from the point that we, we want to take. Now, is it okay to, to discretize the lattice action by taking a more complicated uh, uh, derivative? Of course it is. There was no reason to take the, the, the simple one besides it, that it was simple. But imagine now putting uh, this more complicated derivative uh, uh, expression into the action here and calculating what the lattice action is. If nothing else, with the simple derivative, if this is my lattice, at least in one dimension, the simple derivative, I had interactions only between the nearest neighbor points because the derivative connected nearest neighbor points. Now, if I take this more complicated derivative, then the point here will know about nearest neighbors next to nearest neighbors to the left, the same to the right. And when I square it, I will have interactions, for example, between these points. That's a much larger, much more complicated setup. So does it matter? Will that system have different properties? Yes and no. And the important thing is that yes, if I look at it as a given coupling at finite correlation length, but no, if I take the continuum limit. And what is the continuum limit when the correlation length is infinite? And you can um, at least tentatively understand why it is. If my have correlation length is comparable to the distance where the interaction takes place, then of course I will feel the difference between nearest neighbor or uh, interaction for distance apart. But if my correlation length is going through the entire page and well beyond it, then it really doesn't happen, matter what happens at a short distance uh, on the lattice. That's how we will uh, find that in the continuum limit, these uh, differences do not matter. Again, if you have uh, studied the uh, critical phenomena and statistical system, this is the phenomena that goes on there the name of universality. Okay. I know that there are a lot of lectures here and I didn't ask if I can assign homework, ex homework exercises, but I do nevertheless. I am not expecting to collect and grade them, but I have a couple of suggestions that if you uh, are not uh, fully familiar to what I discussed until now. Uh, there are a couple of easy, or some of them are not that easy, uh, exercises that you could think about, try to solve, uh, because it will help um, in uh, understanding or following the lectures. So let's. Uh, go through uh, them, let me try to explain them. I uh, also know that there is a Slack channel for this school. If you try to do the, the exercises and you don't understand them or you get stuck, or if you have a solution that you want to share, I encourage you to uh, communicate with me or with others uh, via the Slack channel. I would like to see if anyone is uh, working or, or trying to do this system. So just a couple of suggestions uh, for for working through this. Um, I wrote down the lattice section in real space, in position space. But of course, for perturbation theory, we would need it in momentum space. See if you can rewrite the action in momentum space 
and see how the momentum space differs from the continuum momentum space representation. This is simply just taking a taking Fourier transforms and understanding what happens with the momenta uh, when there is a cutoff. Um, if you have the action, the lattice action in momentum space, it should be fairly straightforward to find the Feynman rules for a perturbative calculation. An interesting question, will there be new diagrams? Are there new vertices? Will they lead to new diagrams? Uh, will perturbation theory be different using lattice than continuum? Um, also, uh, along the perturbative line, what is the propagator of the phi field? How does that differ from the 1 over t square plus m square uh, well known form of the continuum setup? These are all. Um, fairly straightforward. If you have all that, you cannot do a, at least set up a lattice perturbation theory calculation, calculate or see what are the uh, Feynman diagrams that contribute to the one loop correction of the four point vertex. So what I mean in here is that uh, we are doing 5 to the 4, so the Feynman diagram, uh, diagrams that describe how the four-point vertex lambda change are in the continuum are just this diagram. And then at one loop level, and then of course that two loop, it gets more complicated. Uh, Will there be new diagrams if you do a lattice calculation? And in particular, there is a loop integral here corresponding to the loop in the, in the second vertex. Can you write it down what it exactly is uh, in terms of the lattice momenta? Can you evaluate it? Now, don't spend too much time on it. I don't think it can be done. It's uh, basically we lost uh, uh, rotational symmetry, and that is not an integral that you can uh, easily evaluate. None of the tricks that you do in continuum uh, Feynman loop calculation would work here. But what you can do, and I encourage you to do, is to identify the dependence on the cutoff, that is, see the asymptotic form of that integral. This is absolutely doable. And if you do it right, it better be the same as in the continuum. That is, again, part of the universality. So these first four exercises were referring to perturbation theory with a lattice model. Um, and then the others are uh, more in the statistical realm. Um, the next one is, could be very, very hard, but, but part of it can be actually evaluated. That is, take the action that uh, we derived before, but use it not, use not the improved five-point derivative. How will the action actually differ from the original one? Uh, this is in some sense an improved action. I will try to talk about improved actions later, uh, probably not covering the entire uh, improvement program, but this is one example that, that shows that actions can be different. Now, the other two points here are uh, quite different. We were looking at a 5 to the 4 model that had a lambda. Uh, coupling in there show that this system is actually reduces to the easing model that has uh, variables, spin variables plus or minus one on each lattice side if you take the lambda infinite limit. 
you will have to rescale the seal to find that out. And you have to see how then we have, we'll have only one coupling left the mass. And you will have to, after rescaling, see how the mass turns into what we call the temperature in the easing model or the coupling of the easing model. That is a very interesting exercise because uh, it is the first indication that the five to the four model and the easing model are actually identical if we look at them uh, in the um, infinite correlation length critical limit. Um, and you are not going to show that with this calculation, this is just an indication that indeed the two model, models can be transformed to each other. And then the last one is that we looked at the one component phi to the four model. You could generalize it to a complex scalar field, which is equivalent to a two component uh, real field. Or even more, you can generalize it to a two-component complex scalar. The former one is the O2 model. The latter one is the model that actually shows up in the standard model, six field, two-component complex scalar. Uh, and uh, if you go through this exercise, you will have uh, lattice or put on the lattice the Higgs field of the standard model. Good. Uh, let's take a minute. Uh, are there any questions that uh, anyone might have? Get the microphone. Thank you. I, I have a question on the beta function of QCD. So uh, there was a coupling mm -hmm. alpha. There was a coupling alpha in the beta function, right? Uh, alpha. G. Well, it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I call it G, but yes, but it's yes, absolutely. Oh, so uh, how? Over four pi. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how that coupling alpha is related to G because there is no alpha in the QCD Lagrangian. Okay. Uh, it, is, it is really a notational thing. What you call alpha is nothing but g squared over 4 pi. Oh, OK. It's the definition. OK? Yeah, thank you. And uh, the unusual thing, and I was uh, not very, very careful here. Um, here I made sure that I wrote g0, which is the bare coupling. Uh, if you think about continuum language. And the perturbative calculation can be done in the bare coupling. Again, if you are used to continuum uh, calculations, you probably don't do that calculation in the bare coupling. You have the beta function expressed in terms of the renormalized coupling. It really does not matter on the lattice uh, uh, we are using, we, we, it is uh, more convenient to use the bare coupling, but for the beta function, it really doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. Can I ask a question? So, mm -hmm. uh, my question is about so you have talked about the discretization effects. Um, so, mm -hmm. we discretize our action differently. So, uh, my question is. Can the different discretization effects help us reach the continuum limit more easily? A very good question, and that's exactly what I referred to when I said improved action. That uh, um, if we could have a discretization that has that uh, is exact in the sense that it removes all cutoff effects, we would be immediately in the continuum limit. So yes. Discretization can help. You don't necessarily see it here. And I believe that uh, um, the easiest way to understand 
how the continuum limit is reached and how to do the calculation is, uh, well, I prefer uh, doing uh, uh, Virzonian renormalization group and understanding the picture based on, on the fixed point structure, the, the, the phase structure and the fixed points of the, and flow diagrams of Virzonian RG. The other approach that is frequently used in lattice calculations, I write it down because you might see it coming up in the in the later discussions, is what's called semantic program. Now I hope I am not uh, semantic. How did he write his name? I think it's semantic like that. Uh, if I misspelled it, I will correct it. I'm sorry. He, 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 it, it, semantic program uh, was originated by uh, semantic, uh, uh, what was his name? I forgot. He, he is a very well known word in lattice back in the 80s. He originated this program. His idea was to actually take. Um, uh, this the lattice action and systematically remove uh, cutoff effect. So the lattice action would, in typically, will have the form of uh, the continuum plus corrections, and the corrections could come as a squared times correction plus would be even a as lattice spacing times correction one plus a square correction two. So maybe I call it that five. Plus higher order terms. And his program gives a perturbative description of how to remove systematically order by order the higher order correction. Uh, and basically the way it is done is what I described here in a little bit it, it's a more systematic way that is you try to discretize it in a in a more uh, precise way in that is in a way that removes a or a square corrections. Again, it is the same that if you um, take the discrete derivative like here delta, and you can you can express it the continuum derivative as delta plus in this case or do a corrections, but if you take the five-point derivative, the corrections will be, I believe, a to the four. So this is uh, how it goes around. Does it help? Good. Any other questions? Okay, if not, I still recommend that you try to do at least think, if, even if you don't go through all the algebra, try to think about how to do some of these exercises because uh, uh, that's how we understand uh, lattice calculations. And again, you see that the first four all refer to uh, perturbation theory. The next one is the improved action program that might uh, we might discuss later, and then the last two are uh, moving into the direction of generalizing the system. Good. So last chance to ask a question. I don't see any in the chat window, and uh, uh, if there is no more, let let's move on. We still have like 45 minutes until the coffee break. So what did we, what did I discuss until now? I did the simple pi to the four scalar system. I would like to move on now to fermions. Uh, fermions are very similar to scalars. They uh, just uh, sit at a lattice site. When we discretize it, we uh, define them on the lattice site instead of continuously. The integral over space will turn into a sum over discrete points, and the functional integral 
now we are turning to a finite, an infinite, but well-defined sum. So that is pretty much the same. And of course, we have the same uh, uh, question of how, what do we do with the derivative? Since the fermion action uh, is linear in the derivative, it is in the continuum just, uh, that, just gamma mu d mu, we can turn it into gamma mu delta mu, uh, just a simple derivative. We can use a simple two-point derivative or the adventurers use the five-point derivative. It's, uh, for now, it is, uh, those are equivalent. And then we have an, a fermion action uh, that now contains discrete, fields de defined on discrete lattice points and uh, a single derivative. What happens to the gauge fields? Now that is tricky. The gauge fields are really parallel transport. They provide the gauge invariant. We want to keep that. The easiest way to introduce this parallel transport gauge symmetry is uh, if I have uh, uh, what we want to do is to take uh, the product of two fermion fields at different lattice points and insert a quantity, a gauge quantity that connects the two points n and n plus mu and has a gauge transformation that is different on the n and n plus mu. And that is, we basically want to put in a a gauge field in between the fermions. That's what I denote by U. And make sure that the U field transforms uh, differently on the left and then from the right. Uh, when I was uh, your age and I learned uh, quantum field theory and gauge invariance and lattice calculations, um, I, I learned all of that in terms of continuum A fields and the really ugly form of, of gauge transformation. And then when I saw the exactly same, the, the, same, the, the identical thing with the lattice uh, setup that is uh, replacing the continuum field A with this parallel transform field U, it was such a revelation, it is so much easier. I saw that that, that must make the lattice useful because it just makes much, much, much more sense. Now, of course, by now you probably uh, learn quantum field theory from modern textbooks uh, like Peskin and Schroeder, who of course uses, not of course, but, but uh, probably naturally uses this parallel transport setup. So you have seen that before. Good. The only difference is that when you do this parallel transport in the continuum, you would have e to the i, the integral of the A field from point uh, one to the next one. But on the lattice, we will replace it with simply a field that is constant, one valued field on the link, and define the corresponding parallel transport as the exponential one. Good. So that will take care of the gauge invariant of the matter field. The same is true for scalars that we uh, will include a U field between nearest neighbor uh, scalars and uh, make that gauge invariant. Now, what happens with the gauge, the pure gauge interaction, that is the F nu nu square term in the continuum? Um, well, what are the gauge invariant objects that we can build from the U link variable? If you think about it, it the, whatever we do, we have to make a closed loop. We have to make product of closed loops. So each transformation at one end 
between the two loops will cancel and other end will cancel, so that will be a gauge invariant object. That is, we have to take product along closed loops, and no matter what form we take, we can take the simplest one that I drew here, or I can take some crazy object like that. As long as if the gauge rings for a closed loop, they are product along the closed loop that will be a gauge invariant object. All of that could be applicable or to, to could we could use to approximate the gauge action, the continuum gauge action. In practice, we frequently choose the simplest option, which I wrote down here. This U of Plucket is just this uh, the product of the U fields along a, a little, a simple square or a Plucket that's called the Plucket action or Wilson action. And of course, to make it into a scalar and, and real, we take the trace and the real part of this Plucket expectation value. The quantity beta here is. Uh, 1 over to 1 over the uh, gauge coupling G0. So that would be a suggestion for the gauge action. And then I have here the gauge invariant fermion action. Now you can see the use in there. OK, so this is gauge invariant. But why do we think that this plucket term, trace you plucket, uh, has anything to do to F mu nu square that we have seen in the continuum setup? Well, uh, since uh, the parallel transport is used already in the continuum setup, it's not that surprising, but we can check. And here I uh, added that yet as, as another possible homework exercise that, that could be very useful to. Uh, works through. If you take the U field expressed in terms of the A, the algebra field A, expand it, just simply take a Taylor expansion and calculate this suggested uh, gauge action term, let it gauge action term, see what it, what it is. You have to do a little bit of algebra, and of course, when you see the A field, let's say on this side and this side, that would be A mu n, and this guy is A mu n plus mu, if this is direction mu. But if you take those two fields, you will have to express this guy as a derivative, that is A mu n plus B mu a mu n, uh, hopefully I wrote it down correctly. So replace, move back everybody to the point n, work out the details, and if you do it right, you should get something like what I wrote down here, that is an irrelevant constant trace of one, and then a term that is proportional to a to the four and f mu square, using the, the derivative notation, and then higher order terms like a to the six. So that is at least the naive indication that this uh, lattice action will have the correct, will have the same form uh, in the lattice spacing goes to zero continuum limit as the continuum action. And because somebody asked about improvement, the, the, you will see that there is an e to the sixth term if you go and really work out the, the next term, and then of course higher order term. An improvement would be to combine this simple plucket action, or that uh, I have here, with the other loop that would be. For example, the one by two loop, and ask that can you write down an action that is a combination of the plucket and the one by two such that this term cancels? 
it is possible to do that. Again, that's part of the semantic improvement program. Um, if that is, uh, I, I didn't plan to talk about it, but I haven't written my, my last talk, last lecture yet, so I am open to suggestions. And maybe we'll discuss that. So that's how gauge fields come in. It look, the gauge fields look very different on the lattice than what you are used to in the continuum, but at least uh, uh, ex perturbatively expanding, uh, expanding the gauge field in terms of the continuum A field to be C. Or if you do the exercise, you will see that, in fact, it reduces the continuum at minus fraction. So that's the gauge field. Any questions? If not, I want to move on to one more issue that is very important and you will, and, and we on the lattice have been fighting it or working with it for decades, ever since uh, Ken Wilson suggested the uh, Lattice form, lattice form of quantum field theory. That's fermion doubling. How do we see that? Uh, I repeat it here. The fermion action not without gauge fields because we can see what I want to show even without gauge fields uh, using a simple two point derivative. Um, what we see here is that really the, the fermion action is linear in the derivative. If you do a Fourier transformation, and then again, I suggest you actually work through the details, you will see that in Fourier space, this fermion action will be proportional to sine of the momentum. That is, you might find something at psi bar gamma mu sine p mu, I put in an a, if p is dimensionful, we need, it, need to make it dimensionless psi plus complex conjugators. Now, why is that uh, uh, a problem? Let me write down here what it would look like for scalars. Scalars are um, quadratic in the derivative. Scalar fields look like mu phi square in the kinetic term, and when you write it in Fourier space, you would find something like the cosine of p mu um, times phi. Now, if I and 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 this well minus one, this cosine is the one that replaces p squared in the continuum formulation. If I make a little sketch of this term as the function of p, I would have with a minus sign a, a cosine function in there. That is the one minus at p0 we have uh, the same form as in the continuum and the fact that the that the the dispersion relation flattens out turns into a cosine function that goes are lattice artifacts but what happens if i do the same for the fermion that has a sign in it that will look like that that is P, and that's the dispersion relation of the interaction term in the fermion. And why is that a problem? We have a, a zero mode here, that's the usual continuum fermion, but we also have a zero mode here. Remember, these are periodic, I should close them uh, together. The point here continues in the other end, so we have here two zeros. If we have two zeros, that means that we have two fermions. 
to light fermions. That is that every direction will have a zero mode at t equals zero and at t equals pi over a. I can say plus or minus, but they are identical. So every direction, this action describes two fermions. And if we are in four dimensions, we have two to the four 16 fermions. So we write down a naive fermion action. We think we have only one fermion flavor. And then it turns around and tells us that not one, it's 60. This is what's called fermion doubling. And it always happens for a, 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 a field that, is, that has a dispersion relation that is sine or linear in, moment, in real space. Now, People tried really, really hard to avoid this fermion doubling. We don't need 16 fermions. We need only two light fermions in QCD. Um, it turns out you cannot just uh, come up with something uh, slightly improved action. Fermion doubling is ultimately related to chiral symmetry. In fact, there is a famous theorem called Niels Anomia no-go theorem that states that it's not possible to construct a lattice fermion action that is ultra-local, preserves chiral symmetry, has the correct continuum limit, and doesn't have a doubling. One of these four we'll have to, we'll have to sacrifice. Um, we certainly want the correct continuum limit. Now, I have not discussed what this ultra local means, but ultra local is uh, when we have an interaction only between nearest neighbor or next to nearest neighbor, or we can say that all the interaction terms in the action are uh, within a finite uh, range. Um, so, what do we give up? We can give up uh, ultra locality. Well, okay, we can give up that that we, we have doubling and those are the naive fermions. 16 species, a little bit too large, too, ma too many for comfort. We can give up ultra locality and those are, what we get then is the so-called ginspark wilson fermions. ginspark wilson fermions have a generalized chiral symmetry on the lattice, but in the continuum, it leads to the perfectly standard continuum symmetry. Uh, the action that, the, that can describe the ginspark wilson fermions are local, but not ultra-local. It basically has uh, interactions up to infinite distance, but those infinite distance terms uh, decay exponentially. That is, the system is still in the correct universality class. Um, ginsburg wilson fermions are beautiful. They are also computationally very expensive. We use them if we really have to, but frequently we want to have something simpler. And the two simplest uh, formulations that have been around and, and uh, investigated are wilson fermions, where we have only one fermion species, no doubling, but chiral symmetry is, up, is totally lost. And staggered fermions, where we cannot get rid of all the doubling, we still have four fermion species in, in the continuum, but we have a U1 remnant chiral symmetry. So I want to spend a few minutes describing both because I believe um, Later lectures will use uh, certainly staggered fermions, and I believe there will be Wilson fermions uh, next week as well. So I would like to have a quick introduction to that. Good. Let's start with Wilson fermions. That was uh, the fir first formulation originally suggested by Ken Wilson back in the probably before 1980, really the very first suggestion. What he suggested is to basically take this sine function 
that we have for the dispersion relation and add to it something so the ends are lifted. I probably should put it in here. That is, add to something to it. So the new dispersion relation has the same form as what we had before, what we needed in the continuum, but the ends where the doublers show up are lifted and there are no zeros anymore. Um, how did he do that? He basically suggested to add a quadratic term to the action. Now, this quadratic term is multiplied by the lattice spacing, so we'll go away if the lattice spacing is taken to zero, that is in the continuum limit. But at finite lattice spacing, it will do the job by lifting the uh, extra zero, the doubler zero mode. There is a, a significant price to, to pay because the new term breaks chiral symmetry and you can work it out, it's fairly straightforward. So we have chiral symmetry recovered only then to take the continuum limit. Um, just for future reference, I want to write down the standard form of the Wilson action, not the one that I wrote it here, but equivalent. If you do a rescaling of the fermion field by a factor uh, square root of two kappa, and kappa is basically the inverse of the fermion mass with some constant, and this is what we call hopping parameter kappa, then the fermion action, the Wilson action will have a fairly straightforward simple form. Just good to look at. It has a, a quadratic term that looks like a mass term, but it's coefficient one. And the hopping term that describes hopping between sides n and n plus mu. The hopping parameter kappa is a complicated form because of chiral symmetry breaking. There is even additive mass renormalization. So typically, if you look at the beta kappa plane, we would find a critical surface that is highly non-trivial, and the continuum limit, of course, is recovered only as beta uh, goes to infinity and uh, we approach this critical line. So this is the Wilson fermion, and it, I would like you to remember this uh, uh, parameter, the hoping parameter. I will use it in a minute. Staggered fermions. Staggered fermions are funny. It turns out that if you take the naive fermions where we have uh, four component Dirac spinors, one can do an exact diagonalization in spinor space. That is, we can make the, 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 the fermions uh, really diagonal, identical in the four spinor components at the price of introducing some oscillating phase factors between different sides. At that point, we can, because the, the system is diagonal, we can drop three of the Dirac spinor components as just keep one. I will denote that one component by chi. And once we do that transformation, which takes a little bit of work, we will find that the action that we call the staggered action has now, in addition to the usual mass term, a term that has the chi field, there are no, no gamma matrices. We basically replace the gamma matrices with a phase factor that oscillates depending on what lattice type we are at. It's, Anna, um, um, yes. We're slightly over time, so if you can wrap it up in five, oh, I'm, five minutes. Oh gosh, all right. I am I am really, really sorry. I looked at my watch and I, I miscalculated the time. I thought that I had had another uh good, you, never mind. It's mid it's it's midnight here and that's <laughs> no no I it, am probably it, we have not. Two more lectures, okay. So. <laughs>
I have two more lectures. I will finish it. I, I'm sorry. I I really should have written down. I, I was looking at my clock and I said, oh, I have plenty of time. But you are right. I don't. So I am going to finish it. Let me finish this one slide. Yes, so I want to say that that these, these are the staggered fermions. Um, because we have only one component now, uh, that one component will double to 16. Doubling, we didn't do anything to the doubling, but those 16 can be turned into four times four, meaning we can recover the four component Dirac uh, spinors and we'll get only, they will get four of them. When we do that, we actually will mix components in a two to the four, four hypercube. So you, you can imagine that Seged fermions have a base star that are two to the four. But we have a U1 chiral symmetry uh, left, which is very useful. But these different Dirac pairs, because they come from different parts of the hypercube, will split. Good. Um, You are all ready for coffee. I am probably ready for for my bed. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, actually, I didn't have a, uh, I had, good. Uh, I apologize for run, running late. Next time I will remember when I have to figure out. I just stop telling it the time. So uh, do we have time for a few more questions? I will talk about this geometric interpretation tomorrow. So that's where I will stop. Any questions in the audience? Let's think, Anna. Okay. Thank you. And um, please give me feedback if you have questions, comments. Uh, uh, via Slack and enjoy the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.